What's going on guys? It's Danny from Fantasy Stock Exchange here and today I'll be riding solo talking about my favorite buys and sells in Dynasty Fantasy Football, going over four players in depth, two buys and two sells, and talking about why action is needed right away to either acquire or ship them. If you guys enjoy content like this and are interested in more, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below and turn those notifications on to never miss a beat on an FSC upload. Good? Subscribe? All right, hit that intro. All right, let's start the video off with an option at the most scarce position in the entirety of both the NFL and fantasy football, and one that will provide a significant edge if the position hits. The guy that I'm going to be talking about is tight end Irv Smith Jr., who, for lack of a better term, will be the next breakout tight end in fantasy football. Let's talk about Irv himself. He's currently going off the board as the tight end 12, 133rd overall in startups. And if you guys watched the channel last year, myself and Corey have a checklist when determining the validity of a tight end's breakout, something of which guys in the past, like George Kittle, Mark Andrews, and even John Lee Smith last year, all checked the box on in recent years. So the three criteria that we look for when determining a breakout tight end is natural talent, efficiency on targets, and a clear path to more targets. So just kind of going further in depth on these three things. Obviously, again, the natural talent, like no shit. You have to be a good player to obviously become a usable asset in fantasy football. Uh, but guys like this, we usually use our own grades, usually use uh, media grades, usually kind of go over the general consensus for really what this player is able to provide. Then you go into the efficiency on targets. You can use their advanced metrics, kind of look at their yards per target, yards after catch, etc stuff like that and clear path to more targets is pretty easy if there's vacated opportunity or if they're uh really primed to set into a bigger role obviously there's going to be more uh path to more targets when you're looking at irv smith jr the natural talent is there i mean this is a former second round 50th overall pick for the vikings in the 2018 nfl draft and he's really shown flashes of this potential since his rookie year he's undeniably been that J vikings gem future long-term plan at the tight end position, even when they had the incumbent Kyle Rudolph. And he was really highly regarded as the tight end three in that 2019 NFL draft after those two Iowa boys with DJ Hawkinson and Noah Fant. Irv has always had the natural ability to really put on a clinic when his number has been called. And his past year in particular is one that really brings a high level of optimism. So now we could talk about it. I mean, number two, efficiency on targets. I kind of mentioned his 2019 can or 2020 campaign. And we talked about it in our tight end dynasty rankings, why he ranks so highly for us. But the numbers in particular just show how much of a baller Irv Smith Jr. truly is. So on the screen right now, you guys can see the uh, overall game logs of, in terms of uh, snap counts, production, everything on the screen. And in week five, there was a real shift in Smith's snap share and routes run. And that continued to really go up until he got hurt and left early against Detroit in week, uh, week nine. In week 10, he came back in a limited fashion, week 11 and 14, but he was back to his normal self in weeks 15 to 17 once fully healthy. And as you guys can see, I mean, the snap share, the route participation, um, the targets were all there when Irv was fully healthy and functioning as that tight end one in the Vikings offense and really prefacing that tight ends video on Monday in the stretch where he took over. We're looking at a nine game sample of 37 targets, 28 receptions, 351 receiving yards and five touchdowns which when paced to a full 16 would be 65 targets, 50 receptions, 624 yards, and nine touchdowns, or, you know, the tight end five last year. This is including games where he was limited. Kyle Rudolph was still on the team. And quite frankly, even if Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen are expected to have 275, 300 targets this year, that's still 200 to 250 up for grabs. And Irv showed with his efficiency last year, Number two in fantasy points per target, number two in quarterback rating when targeted, and number eight in targets, uh, yards per target amongst the tight end position, that he can fully take over that expanded role. Now let's talk about the clear path to more targets. I mean, the team vacates 62 targets as a whole, with the majority coming from tight end Kyle Rudolph's departure, which the Vikings really failed to address with any significant capital in both free agency and the draft. In 2020, Kirk Cousins actually led the league with 248 dropbacks and 226 of his 519 passing attempts coming with two tight ends on the field. 
With the departure of Kyle Rudolph and no real substitution, we could absolutely see more 11 personnel sets, which in turn would give Irv a lot more room to operate in that middle of the field. I mean, Irv is absolutely primed to break out in a big way this year. And just on sheer opportunity he has, you're currently getting him as the tight end 12, 133rd overall. In terms of trade value, you could easily scoop up Irv Smith Jr. right now in your drafts for a late second early third round 2021 rookie pick. And this is an absolute smash to me. I mean, similar to what we've seen in recent years, if you can buy these tight ends when they are at this che at their cheapest, and Irv Smith right now is going to be at his cheapest that I see him in maybe the next three, four years, take this value and run with it because Irv Smith is going to break out this year. All right, let's get into the second player and actually a player you guys would have seen on the thumbnail, but I'm actually going to be talking about Debo Samuel, who's currently valued as the wide receiver 37, 107th overall. And this is just absolutely ludicrous to me. I understand that he was hurt in 2020, but we're still talking about a kid who was the PPR wide receiver 32 as a rookie in 15 games and averaged 15.3 PPR points per game in the games that he played 65 plus percent of snaps. And even if you look at his 2020, being hurt, missing time and all, despite really being hurt and dealing with a turnstile at quarterback with Jimmy Garoppolo only playing in six games this past year, his averages were still phenomenal given the circumstances. I mean, you're talking about a guy who averaged 14.5 fantasy points per game, which would have been a wide receiver 25 pace in, uh, in the games that he played 60 plus percent of the snaps. And he did that on one touchdown, 14.5 fantasy points per game. Wide receiver 25 pace in games that he had 60 plus percent of snaps, one touchdown. He had 41 targets in those five games, and he had an 80 plus percent snap share in all but one game in that five game healthy stretch. And really, despite only playing seven total games, he still ranked ninth in yards per route run and 14th league wine in yards after the catch at 389 after ranking 20th and 5th respectively uh, in 2019 in those stats. So overall, I mean, we all know what Debo Samuel's role is going to be in this 49ers offense. And I understand the question mark that people are going to have. They've never really seen Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, and George Kittle on the field together. But regardless, Debo is locked into his role as that player that will be manufactured touches regardless by Kyle Shanahan. And if you're actually looking at the offense in general, San Francisco vacates 120 major wide receivers slash tight end targets from 2020 with the loss of Kendrick Bourne and Jordan Reed, who, despite being labeled as a tight end, actually spent 64.8% of his total snaps in the slot in 2020, which is the fourth highest in the NFL. We know what Debo has shown both the talent, the commitment, and the youth, and yet he st he's still that extremely valuable wide receiver flex that he's been throughout his career. And yet he's somehow falling to the end of the eighth round wide receiver 37 in startup drafts. If this is indicative of his current post draft value, you could potentially move him for an early second round pick in 2021, or even a 2022 two and three to lock yourself into a proven talent like Debo Samuel. And the fact that the likes of LaVisca Chanel, whom we hope, turns into Debo Samuel, yet, you know, works with Urban Meyer rather than Kyle Shanahan to trust in creatively implementing him in the offense. And Julio Jones, who, unlike Debo, is a depreciating asset from here on out. It just speaks volumes to how cheap Samuel is currently going. And I understand he may never enter that top 10 overall wide receiver in fantasy type territory, but I'm fully confident in Debo Samuel being that high upside wide receiver two for your team given the commitment Shannon has had in involving him in the offense since he's come into the NFL in that second round pick two years ago. So overall, at his current value, I really plan on owning Debo in every single league I'm in. And as you guys can see, I mean, this is evidenced by my commitment to my word as I actually got him in our FSE listener dino league. So you guys can see that on the screen. But with that being said, Talked about the risers. We talked about the guys that are going to make you happy. The guys that you want to get now, you want to get for the low low, you want to really have to appreciate and value on your team. Let's talk about the followers. Don't call me biased. I understand you're going to see this right now. You're going to see the thumbnail. You're going to see Jalen Hurts on it. You're going to call me biased because I'm a Cowboys fan. But <laughs> I'm not here to deny the talent or the ceiling because both do exist with Jalen Hurts. But his current value in ADP indicates to me that the public has not baked in the risk that he has. 
Let's start with the player himself. I mean, Hurts, while I did like him coming out of college to an extent, I did think he was a fine second round type player. Uh, he was still a flawed passer coming out and struggling for the most part with his processing speeds and overall accuracy in tight windows, even at the collegiate level. And while he displayed that he was a depth rusher this year, totaling 301 rushing yards and 51 carries in the final five games of the year to go along with three rushing touchdowns. 35.2 of his total rushing output and carries came in that week 14 game against New Orleans. And I get it. While he will be praised for his fantasy performances down the stretch, and deservedly so, he was really good from a fantasy perspective. Let's not forget that he was also PFF's 55th graded passer, was 42nd in adjusted completion percentage, had the 38th best passer rating in the league, and, you know, completed 52% of his passes and had a six to four touchdown interception ratio, which while sufficient in, in, in fantasy football standards was not good by NFL standards, which leads me to my further and more important point. We talked about the actual player himself. We talked about the level of play. The main question mark I have with Jalen Hurts is the replaceability. I mean, remember, this is dynasty. And while Hurts is young and on the surface may seem like a rebuilding type asset, given his age, he's only 22 years old. He's actually one I... I review more as being a win now, given the lack of commitment we've seen from the Eagles front office thus far, which is crazy to say about a 22 year old. Before anybody even thinks about comparing the situation to rookie Lamar Jackson or second year Josh Allen, let's sit down for a second and really talk about the team commitment and long term stability because they, quite frankly, are not close. I mean, <laughs> Allen was a top 10 pick, and the Ravens traded up to secure Jackson and that fifth year option in the first round of 2018. Hertz was a second round pick who validated the concerns that many pundits have about him as a passer. And for a team that has shown that they have a consistent short term memory when it comes to quarterback success, for instance, like the guy that Hertz replaced in Philly and Carson Wentz, as you guys can see, I mean, when asked who his starter would be going into the season, coach Nick Sirianni basically did not even commit to Jalen Hurts. I understand, again, this is all hoopla. This is all media talk. But if you're sure this guy is your franchise quarterback, if you're going into the season locked and loaded, ready to have a superstar level, franchise level type quarterback, it's so easy to just say, oh yeah, you know, Hurts is expected to be our starter. He wouldn't even go that far. So overall, I mean, it's a cutthroat business. And unfortunately for Hurts, he has neither the draft capital or the incredible play in 2020 to really validate their decision to deadlock him in for the future and while many have stated that oh well look at the eagles i mean they traded down from six because they're committed to hurts they they could have just stuck at six and picked a quarterback that's actually simply not the case because in fact they attempted to move up to third overall in this nfl draft according to ian rapport you guys can see that on the screen if zach wilson was available at that third pick Obviously, again, the Jets were taking him at second overall all along, so they were not be able, they would not have been able to make that deal. But it just goes to show that they were looking at quarterback in this draft. They just thought that Zach Wilson was the guy that they targeted. They didn't look at Lance. They didn't look at Fields. It was Zach Wilson if they moved up. In addition to this, they've been linked with potentially packaging that additional draft capital they earned from their move down from six to twelve, that 2022 first round pick from Miami. And they've been really shopping it this offseason, potentially for a upgrade at the quarterback position if a superstar caliber quarterback were to become available. So you guys can see it on the screen right now. Tons of rumors. I mean, you got on one hand, Deshaun Watson may be having a chance to get there. On the other hand, you've talked about the possibility of Russell Wilson maybe landing there. I mean, it just goes to show that for a team that says that they're committed to their quarterback or actually even haven't done that, it's a lot, a lot of ambiguity going on with this situation. So let's quickly recap it. They tried to move up to number three for Zach Wilson. Wilson, sorry. When they realized they couldn't, they traded down to acquire more future assets in 2022. And then have been rumored to use those future assets to get Jalen Hurts replacement. On top of all of this, we're still talking about an Eagles team who should be slated to have a top pick in 2022 in struggle. I mean, according to every betting website I've seen, they have a six and a half win over under, which is actually tied for the fourth lowest total in the entire league. What's stopping them from taking a top quarterback in what's considered a deep 2022 class of the position? If a guy like Spencer Rattler or Kadon Slovis is staring them at the face in that top five, top 10 range that they're expected to pick. For a guy who's currently going off the board as the quarterback 14, 
to have this many question marks in terms of his staying power on his team and truthers validating his value off a five game sample size in a lost uh, season for Philly. It really baffles me. You could sell Hertz now and you could potentially net a huge package, huge package for him, given the current valuation of his uh, supporters and redraft. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. If you want to take Hertz and redraft as a potential fringe top 10 option, I think his rushing upside and potential strides to improve as a passer are more than fine taking that chance on. But in Dynasty, how can you take a guy with this many question marks at this exorbitant of an ADP? It makes no sense. So overall, if you have Jalen Hurts and you can ship him right now for a mid to late first round pick in 2021 or even a package of 2022 picks, I would do that without missing a beat. So overall, let's, uh, let's move on to the final option of the video, the final sell of the video. And that's going to be Mike Jasicki, tight end from the Miami Dolphins, currently going off the board as the tight end 10 in startup drafts. So overall, Mike Jasicki is a player who is most definitely hurt by these Dolphins offseason moves. Let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not look past it. Let's be blunt about it. They drafted Jalen Waddell, sixth overall in the 2021 draft. They drafted Mike Jasicki's replacement in the third round in Hunter Long and also signed Will Fuller on a one-year deal. And if you guys need any context as to what kind of players Jalen Waddle, Hunter Long are, if you're new to the channel, you haven't seen it already, in their 2020 college football seasons, Hunter Long was graded as PFS second best tight end with over 30 targets, trailing only Kyle Pitts, and spent 32.8% of his snaps in the slot. He really profiles as that Jasicki replacement, a good athletic tight end that can give you versatility in the slot. Now let's talk about Waddle. This year's sixth overall pick. Waddle is a player who has the dynamic ability to really play all over the field, but given his usage in college where he spent 68.1% of his snaps in the slot, his unique ability and blend of an incredible yak while also possessing extreme verticality to stretch that seam in the slot, combined with the presences of Devontae Parker and said Will Fuller manning that X and Z position when the team is at full strength, that really only leaves the slot open for Waddle. What does that do for Mike Jasicki? Well, it really puts him in a rough spot because the majority of his production this year actually came while he was lined up in the slot. And he doesn't really profile as a traditional inline tight end from what we've seen from his usage so far in his career. So for context, as you guys can see on the screen, his slot reliance was pretty ridiculous in 2020. Mike had roughly a 68% snap share in the slot this past season, second league wide. And the majority of his production evidently came well aligned there. So you guys can see he had 85 total targets this year. 68 came in the slot. 53 total catches, of which 49 came in the slot, and 588 of his 703 uh, receiving yards and five of his six touchdowns actually came while aligned in the slot after running the second most total routes behind Travis Kelsey while aligned in the slot. The lack of slot snaps in this upcoming year really dampens his 2021 season. I get it. If you wanted to say, oh, okay, you know what? He, in 2021, he may not be that great redraft tight end, but this is still dynasty. He's still 26. He's still going to make it to free agency in 2022. What's stopping me from taking him uh, and just hoping for a 2022 big signing where I can sell him? Well, what if he signs elsewhere and makes you value, right? Like, I mean, that's the main question. Mark. Let's take a look at the top five free agents signed in terms of average per year contract through free agency in the past three off seasons and really how it, it has equated so far in terms of fantasy football production. So you guys can see on the screen right now, the 2020, 2019, and 2018 free agency classes and really how they have fared in fantasy football. So amongst this list, three players, three total players in Jimmy Graham, Eric Ebron and Jared Cook have finished with a top 15 fantasy season since signing. And Ebron is actually the only player to have a top 10 season. So overall, by drafting Jasicki at his current tight end 10 ADP, you're getting a tight end whose win now outlook is much bleaker than it was going into the offseason. And based off these past three years of free agency signings, has a 20% chance at a top 15 season and a 7% chance at a top 10 season. With so much risk involved, just trade Jasicki for Irv Plus. Trade Jasicki for Cole Komet Plus. There's so many talented tight ends in much better, less ambiguous situations that will really increase your chances at high-level production at this position. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have made it this far in the video, comment Dynasty Danny down below. Stay tuned on this channel all offseason.
Bushy and I got some big plans for you on this FSC channel. Super stoked to get you a content-filled off-season full of videos. With that being said, God bless. And peace out.